These days, there are many things we are trying not to do. Touch our faces. We are trying not to stand too close. We're not going shopping unless we absolutely need something. It's often counterintuitive, like approaching a friend and not shaking hands, or for some of us, not dropping in on a loved one. These are things we don't do right now because not doing them is an act of kindness. And likewise, when we follow Jesus Christ, there are things that we do not do because to not do them is an act of love. Last time we talked about living a life of love and how imitating God includes and is expressed by living a life of love as Christ loved us and gave himself for our sins. And so today, as we continue on in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 3 through 5, we're going to see something about what love is not like. And so there are two basic instructions in this passage, and the first has to do with what we say no to. So first of all, say no to what we can't keep. Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you, he says. Such sins have no place among God's people. Sexual immorality had come to refer to any sexual activity outside of a covenant of marriage between one man and one woman. And some of the background of sexual immorality and the term uh, had to do with, in the ancient times, how people would, in various cultures, worship the Baals, uh, local gods or so-called deities, which would be accredited with giving fertility to the land and making it productive. And the way they would worship the Baals was to construct a temple in their honor and carry out prostitution within the confines of that temple. This was somehow seen as worship. Unfortunately, sometimes ancient Israel would copy this and participate in this, attributing its prosperity and well-being to the Baals. And so prophets like Jeremiah, for example, voiced God's judgment of this. And he said, for example, I fed my people until they were full, but they thanked me by committing adultery and lining up at the brothels. So instead of thanking God, they had taken it upon themselves to act with immorality and greed. And by the time Paul wrote this letter to the Ephesian church, sexual activity outside of marriage was treated almost as if it was just the norm. Uh, men of influence and philosophers often had mistresses. This was public knowledge. And they had their wives who brought up their children and looked after their households. So women were often very much objectified in this society. Immorality was seen as somewhat normative. And next he names the word impurity, which follows after and really expresses the same idea, only gives it a, a broader definition even. He's already used the word in the previous chapter. He said, they have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. And then Paul adds the word greed. And he says of these three things, sexual immorality, impurity, and greed, these have no place among God's people, among you, meaning those who follow Jesus Christ and declare that he is Lord. And so he's combining these three things in a sense, this greed, this drivenness toward fulfilling human desire any way possible with an insatiable desire for more. So what is sexual immorality? Is it sexual feelings? No, God created us as sexual beings, and sexual feelings are normative. Uh, sexuality, however, cannot be reduced to and defined by the act of sexual intimacy. So God created marriage between a man and a woman so that sexual intimacy could be a beautiful expression of love. But sexuality is much more broad than the mere act of sexual intimacy. Men and women are created as sexual beings and we bring our sexuality into our leadership activity, different things that we do, we do differently. For example, men and women might lead differently from one another, but still very effectively. All of this is part of their expression of being men and being women. But 
sexuality goes off track when it becomes the only identifier we use for ourselves or the only priority in life. And so the Apostle Paul is confronting people who have made it the only priority and have taken it out of its context. In other words, men don't complete women and women don't complete men. We complement one another, but only Christ completes humanity. And so greed does not fill our need. No matter what that need is, greed or lust for more doesn't fill the need. Verse 4 then goes on and talks about speech patterns and other things we should say no to in how we talk. It says obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes. These are not for you. You, again, being a reference to people who say, Jesus is the Lord of my life. These kind of speech patterns are perhaps like the metaphorical gateway drug to uh, the expression of sin. Uh, in fact, maybe less offensive publicly and in some way to verbalize these things rather than actually committing the offenses themselves of sexual immorality, impurity, or greed. Kind of a way of talking the sin without walking the sin. The term obscene stories is self-explanatory. Foolish talk referred to just actually having silly things to say continuously with no sense of purpose. And coarse jokes involves, or coarse talk, involved innuendo or spinning every situation, depending on its context, to make the most of it, to just please the audience, regardless of what it does to one's character or the people who are listening. Uh, this kind of instruction might be even more challenging than actually prohibiting sexual immorality and impurity and greed, simply because if one has a quick wit and a sharp tongue, it's not that difficult to reel off an, an unclean joke or perhaps to uh, spiel off some kind of innuendo or turn the conversation into something that's funny but for one's own purposes without considering the well-being of the people around us. And so, in Christ, we're designed for something different. We're designed to speak differently. And greed, including incorporating it into our speech patterns, does not fill our need. It might temporarily feel good, but it leaves us empty. However, God does not lead, leave us in a vacuum here. He doesn't say, I'm going to take away everything that's fun from you. Rather, he gives us something else to take its place. And that something else is living a thankful life. So while we say no to things that we can't keep, we say thanks for what we can't lose. Verse 4 concludes, Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. Dante Gabriel Rossetti joked, the worst moment for an atheist is when he is genuinely thankful but realizes he has no one to thank. Thanksgiving or being thankful, thanking God for what we have is the opposite of obscene stories or foolish talk or coarse speech. Those things reveal our emptiness. Jesus said this, A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart, and an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. What you say flows from what is in your heart. Thanking God for what he's given us is our way of celebrating God's rich gifts to us. The fact that he has brought us into his family, his kingdom, when we have invited Jesus Christ into our lives and made him Lord. And so verse 5 emphasizes this and says, you can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. Notice the repetition of these same three words here, sexual immorality, impurity, and greed. Thanking God for what he has given us diverts our attention away from those lusts that we have or greed for more and more things that do not really fill the needs of our hearts. Greed can't fulfill our need, but we thank God that he has put us into his kingdom, and in his kingdom, he has fulfilled the deepest need of our hearts, that for a place to be loved and known and made complete, 
in a relationship in which we walk with Jesus Christ and are filled with his Holy Spirit day by day as we learn to know him. So again, greed doesn't meet our need, but in the kingdom of God, we give thanks that he has and does meet our needs. One evening I was mulling, mulling over many of the different ideas that have come to mind about how we can serve people best right now during this time and then in the future when we get back to whatever normal is going to look like. And as I mulled these things over and thought about the options, I felt almost overwhelmed and even anxious by the number of things I was thinking of and how do we do this best. And that night I happened to read Psalm 50. It's been my evening habit to read one psalm and reflect on it for a few moments. And so I turned to Psalm 50. And in Psalm 50, God calls the people together to worship him. And uh, for a time, it's depicting a time of judgment. But he says to his people, in effect, in my paraphrase, look, I'm, I'm not offended by the offerings you're bringing to me. But he said, you need to remember that I already own all of the cattle and all of the livestock. It's already mine. What I really want from you is a thankful heart. That's what true worship is. He ends the psalm by saying this, but giving thanks is a sacrifice that truly honors me. If you keep to my path, I will reveal to you the salvation of God. Simple. Instead of being driven by desires, even the desire for good things, we are to simply fall back to thanking God for who he is and what he has provided for us. This is the way we pivot towards spiritual wholeness in those moments when we're tempted to be greedy for what's not ours and what we cannot keep. If immorality and greed has shaped our choices, the fantastic news is that God has provided for us forgiveness and a way of closeness with him through faith in Jesus Christ. When Jesus was confronting some very religious people, he said that self-righteous people had in fact been ignoring him and not believed in him, while prostitutes and tax cheats and others had been entering the kingdom of God because they'd been turning from their sin, turning to God and believing in Christ as the Son of God. Well, he said the self-righteous people were lost. So we bring thanks to God for the gift of his Son and what he's done for us, for including us in his kingdom. We pivot toward him in those moments when we're tempted just to become rampant consumers of whatever it is that's being thrown at us or marketed to us. G.K. Chesterton said, if my children wake up on Christmas morning and have someone to thank for putting candy in their stocking, have I no one to thank for putting two feet in mine? Say no to what you can't keep and say thanks for what you can't lose. God has drawn you and me into his kingdom through faith in Jesus Christ. And then Paul ends verse 5 with this. For a greedy person is an idolater worshiping the things of this world. The greedy person ultimately makes an idol of himself and wants to subject everything or everyone to oneself instead of worshiping the living God. The last of the Ten Commandments says this. You must not covet your neighbor's house you must not covet your neighbor's wife, male or female servant, ox or donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. This summarizes all the other Ten Commandments because it's the desire for what is not ours that causes us to commit idolatry, to in fact put ourselves in the place of God, to desire worship, to exalt ourselves, to run down another person, bear fa false witness against someone, to steal, uh, even to kill, in order to take control of our lives. Now, probably most of us don't see a donkey in our neighbor's yard, so we're not likely to covet that. But we could contextualize this and put it in our own context by saying, Maybe don't desire your neighbor's truck or car or trailer or boat or SUV or ATV 
or your neighbor's job, or lifestyle, or style, or figure, or shoes, or hair, and so on and so forth. Whatever we don't have, if we put our attention on it, it can easily become something we practically worship. Greed is idol worship. Greed craves power over people and positions and products. Greed fuels fantasy for sex with no boundaries. It uh, fuels lust for laughs, regardless of how it impacts the people we're talking to. It fuels our desire for more and more things, whether they bring satisfaction in the long term or not. Greed drives consumerism, whereas thanking God drives generosity. Greed results from ignoring God's presence. Paul wrote, Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that should never be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, and greed. Say no to what you can't keep and thanks for what you can't lose. So how do we respond? Thankfulness keeps us alive to God's presence and to his gifts. Thankfulness keeps our spirits tuned in to what God has given us and to what he wants to give us. Greed does not meet our needs. So practice being thankful for what he has given. Maybe we find it difficult not to desire more when we can't go shopping, perhaps, to just get online and click and buy because it fills a need. Or perhaps we're tempted to search websites that reveal pornography. In all of these things, we can pivot from this to thanking God for what he's given us instead, for his presence in our lives that will not go away no matter what the conditions that surround us. A thankful lifestyle is a simpler lifestyle. So how about making a list today of all of the goodness God has given to you? Write those things down. Or maybe brainstorm with your husband or your wife or a friend over the phone and list the things that God has done for you. Your moments of majesty, if you like. Express those things and give thanks to God for what he's done for you. After a midnight Christmas Eve service, an exhausted inner city pastor encountered a homeless man who had come to the service. And the man needed help. And so this worn out pastor decided that he would take this new friend to the shelter. He would drive him there. He admitted to himself as they traveled through the city that he felt a bit of resentment to this one need too many. In fact, he found he was even a bit irritated with God at the time. Slowly he began to process this and then he realized he hadn't even asked the man's name. And so he turned to him and said, what is your name, sir? And the man responded, Jesus. Anglicized, that's Jesus. It wasn't lost on this pastor, and in fact, joy and a sense of humor swept over him at that moment when he realized that he had been griping to God about taking a man named Jesus to a shelter on Christmas Eve. Sometimes it's easy not to notice the things God has put right in front of us and fail to be thankful. Say no to the things that you can't keep and say thanks for the things you can't lose. Greed does not meet our need, but thanksgiving awakens our spirits to the goodness of God. God bless you as you give thanks today.